Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Sabbath Rest Book Talk for October of 2017, where our theme this month is the afterlife. Ooh, I'm sorry, I have to do that motion every time I say that because like Homer Simpson did a video for his kids. Anyway, sorry, I'm like making more obscure television references that my co-hostesses might not get. Rebecca, do you have <laughs> Finnegan there with you? Um, no, but I can get, come here, Finn. All right, Griffin. so Rebecca's roommate it has a cat that looks just like my cat, who's and his name was Hobie, and but this is Finnegan. Anyway, Hobie was a, a very amazing cat, and um, it seems fitting that we are talking about the kitty cats tonight because one of our book selections for this evening by Marcus Ewart, which is a very, very sweet and adorable book. But anyway, is Finn here? No. Give me two seconds. Getting our cats on screen is very important here at Sabbath Rest Book Talk, as I'm sure you all understand. <laughs> Rebecca, do you oh. have any amusing cats to... Oh, okay, there's Finn again. Say hi, Finn. <laughs> hi, Finn. Oh, oh, yeah, usually he's a schmoozer, but today he's too busy beating up his sister. Oh, all right. Well, that, that <laughs> happens in, in any household of two-legged or four-legged creatures. Um, anyway, so... <laughs> We're talking about cats when we first got started because we were so inspired <clears throat> by this month's selection. But that was Rebecca. Rebecca, say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, I am a freelance writer and editor and sisters up here in Ann Arbor. And I'm not exactly a crazy millennial cat lady, but I'm getting close. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we, we all have goals. <laughs> Sorry, that made me laugh so hard. I kicked my computer desk. Carolyn, how about you introduce yourself to our readers this evening? Well, I have no cats, although we had a stray when I was a kid. Um, and I'm here in Hershey, Hershey Pennsylvania, and a um, mom of uh, four kids who are uh, variously hiding in different places so you won't see them. And um, I have three novels, all uh, inspirational romances. And yeah, that's that's about it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the cat, the cat, I, I've got the computer on a chair. The cat just climbed up the back of the chair and kind of like off the other direction. <laughs> I'm so sorry the camera was not turned that way. <laughs> that was, I would have missed it. No, uh, it's well, not the amusing. <laughs> I'm I'm Erin McCole Cup. I'm the author of the Jane E. Friendless Orphan series. I'm also a strong believer in the power of fiction. I am also currently not a cat owner, but I am a dog owner. So if you hear my rat terrier Sigma whining in the background, I apologize. He's just very excited and confused as to why he doesn't get to sit on my lap and lick my face through this entire process. Anyway, back to the topic of this evening. We are talking about fiction about the afterlife. As you may or may not know, Sabbath Rest Book Talk is a celebration of all the good things that fiction does for us. So what we are going to do tonight in the topic of the afterlife is we're going to take a look at how we as humans are the only species that has any evidence that we think about what happens after we die. Even my atheist friends, you still had to think about what happens afterwards. Even if you are firmly convinced that nothing happens, you still had to think about it. Whereas Sigma over there in the crate is whining. He has no idea what happens. He doesn't think about it. So obviously thoughts about the afterlife are something that makes us human. So I kind of think that's a pretty good topic to talk about with on Sabbath Rest Book Talk, especially as we dive into the month of October with Halloween at the end of it. So let's start talking. Hmm, what shall we begin with? I think I'd like to save Mummy Cat for last because it's it's just so adorable. And I think we should begin our talking with cats and end it with cats. So in the middle, let's see. I just said in the middle. No, now, what should we talk about now? Let's talk about Spectre. Who's got a copy of Spectre to show? I got Spectre. I'm super prepared. <laughs> My this book is so good it walked away. I think a ghost might have taken it. <laughs> who, who wants to talk about Spectre first and what it tells us about human thoughts about the afterlife? I'll talk about Spectre. <laughs> um, I this is a part of a three book series. I hadn't read the other two, but I've you could jump right in. Um, and I just love this the characters. Um, Selena is a great heroine, and 
<laughs> funny reading this when you start to getting more into the there's a mystery involved but there's the afterlife was integrated in that as well and i just loved how it was handled because as someone whose tv is like always tuned to these like ghostly stories and the illuminati and this and that and everything um it really worked in a um very common sense approach to the afterlife common sense um, acknowledging the paranormal and that there's more beyond us, but it did it in a way that was both very relatable to the average Joe, but also very respectful of what the church teaches. And I just thought it was done well. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, sorry, I it, oh, go ahead, Rebecca. I'm sorry. <laughs> just kind of playing off of that, um, because of the characters that you do have in the story, you get a number of different reactions to the ap to the appearance of the afterlife in the story. So you get Reed, who's the atheist still, or atheist or agnostic, I can't remember what he is. Um, and you get the, the very pious Catholic Selena, who's skeptical, but rooted enough to realize that there's something happening. And it's interesting to see kind of each character's take on what's going on. Yeah, I think John Desjardins does that really well in all three of the books in the Selena de la Cruz um, and Max Doublefield trilogy. I'm getting a feedback echo. Okay. Um, what he does really well is he kind of shows faith as something that is, he shows all the different approaches that people take to faith, either disdain, doubt, um devotion and he shows that through all of his different characters and i also i keep i have met him in person i keep wanting to ask him how did he create this feeling of mexican and mexican-american culture well mexicans are americans they just live in the south southern part of north. anyway long story short let's put the geography away for a moment how he got such a good description and gave the reader such a strong feeling of the culture even though he, as far as I know, he didn't grow up in that culture. So I, I keep wanting to ask him that, but I haven't worked up the nerve because he, he's a quiet, gentlemanly sort of person. Um, and if he watches this, he's probably like curling up in, in absolute embarrassment as, as we see. <laughs> um, but I, I really, I like how he shows these different characters and their approaches to each other, to the idea that there is something beyond the here and now. And how our different backgrounds contribute to our ideas of what we are expecting to happen after we die. After we die. Like him yeah. does that really well. What are some... Uh, yeah, I love the, um, the godmother character who is, you know, a little superstitious, but yet she's got more right than she's got wrong. And her approach is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, actually, can anybody really quickly give a summary for our viewers of um, what Spectre is about? So essentially, it's um, there's kind of two parallel things happening. Um, one is the investigation into the murder of a cardinal that happened in Mexico, and it's all tied up with a couple of drug cartels and what really happened. Um, and Selena's father... Um, is basically given evidence that he's been he was involved with it before he died um and so simultaneously you've got selena who's preparing for her wedding and in both investigating the murder and coming to terms with her father and um the forgiveness that he may or may not in her opinion be merited mm, yeah i like i do like how john sort of worked with the that the sins we commit in this life, even after we pass on to somewhere else, those sins can still live on and affect the people who we leave behind. And I think Selena really shows that her, you know, her working through her memories and the evidence and her family's memories of what happened really showed that that reality that just because that someone is gone they're not gone, whether you believe in ghosts or not. Carolyn, did you want to add anything else about Spectre? Only I just love the little Ghostbuster characters that came in for just a, a short bit. They were I mean, hilarious. They're, just, yeah. they're just perfect. I just, just, you know, made me smile. And, uh, you know, they went into saying the St. Michael, the Archangel prayer in Latin and everything. It was just, 
it was they were great yeah they really they added the, a bit of um just all, another world to to the whole the whole kit and caboodle mm -hmm. um yeah. the next book i want us to talk about is angelhood by amy catapan hey, i'm sorry aj catapan now y'all know her her first name Sorry, uh, <laughs> this is um, a, a novel, it's a YA novel uh, about what happens if someone commits suicide and what happens to that person afterwards. Um, we've got the story of Nanette, who is a senior in high school and she has, you know, dealt with some difficulty in her past. Her parents have divorced, there's conflict, and she, has applied to her dream college and then she doesn't get in and all sorts of things are happening so that she thinks that her life isn't worth living anymore so she tries to take her own life and the story is what happens afterwards and it's it's definitely uh, the kind of book that i think parents should read with their kids and have a discussion because it brings up all sorts of ideas about the afterlife and um, there might be some things, I don't want to spoil anything, but there might be some things to talk about in here about um, how very permanent suicide is. Yeah. So that's that's something that's really worth talking about. As a parent, I, I really felt pretty strongly I needed to talk to my kids about this after they read Angel Hood. It's a very powerful story, very gripping, highly recommended, but there's a lot to talk about in there um and again it sort of goes back to what we said when we were talking about um specter that the choices we make now are still with the people we leave behind and i think that's and we're talking about the afterlife and what happens after a person dies uh to that person but there's also been this interplay that, that you see in both specter and angelhood that what happens after a person dies you have to wonder how much that person is still involved even if we can't see or feel or hear that person per se carolyn what would you like to add about angelhood well i think one of the things angelhood does really well is it takes the character nanette and um part of what she's in um living through in the afterlife is helping somebody else who's in similar circumstances, another girl who's considering taking her life. And I think it's so helpful that, especially when you're a teenager, you, you can hyper-focus on yourself and my problems and this is awful and that is awful. And when you start to look outside yourself, you see things sometimes from a completely different point of view because we tend to be harder on ourselves and you know take things more deeply and personally, whereas when you you're dealing with someone else, you're more forgiving, you can see possibilities better. And I think that's part of the beauty of what happens in angelhood is Nanette can come outside herself a bit and see what maybe it looks from the other side and how through someone else's choices, she can recognize maybe where she went wrong. Yeah, I agree. I like that, um, that it showed how damaging it can be, how damaging, not can be, how damaging it is to keep ourselves self-focused even when we're young that's um one of the dangers i think not just of being a teenager but just of being human is that to be so like you said so focused on our own problems that we need to really train ourselves and our children those of us who have them to humble ourselves to the point that we're looking at others because it could really you know caring about others could save our own lives if you think about it rebecca what did you want to add about angelhood it was a really interesting read for me i'd kind of i'd seen this and i and i've read um her other book seven riddles to nowhere but i'd kind of shied away from angelhood because it was one of those like I don't really understand what you're doing here just based on the back cover and I'm not really sure what I think about it when I finally you know needed to read it for this I was like this is I think the most compelling part was that what gave Nanette purpose and what eventually then gave the other girl purpose was I guess just a sense of the value of small actions because Nanette, I think, got so hyper-focused on 
crashing down around me, nothing matters anymore. Whereas she eventually learns that just getting one girl in, interested in, in getting her poem published in the school newspaper and the little action of distracting her from thinking too much about that it's all the small actions that built up to the eventual hope and redemption. Yeah, I honestly, I didn't see that the first time through, but that, now that you mention it, I, I see what you mean, how the little things that basically this, in angelhood, there's this, for lack of a better term, platoon of, of people who have um, taken their own lives, who are now tasked with preventing that in the lives of other people, and how they each have to bring you know the the reality that each person matters to someone who is about to let that go and they are they, these angels are restricted a lot of times by their own there's a series of limitations it's kind of hard to describe you have to read it to to you know what they're doing that you know the the smallest things that they can do they have to build up but each small thing that they do matters and I like the, the theme of um, forgiveness as well. Forgiveness of self, forgiveness of people who have made us feel like we don't matter. Because in this world, um, there's so much, you know, especially for kids, there's cyberbullying. And just last weekend I was reading about this, I think 12 year old girl who took her own life because people were harassing her on social media. And it really brought home for me as a person, you know, through, you know, stories like that, stories like what um, A.J. Catapan writes about in the Angelhood, what she shows us that it's so important for us to establish for ourselves and for our children that your worth is not in whether or not you reach your goals. Your worth is not in what other people think of you. Your worth is in the fact that you exist and that you are a child of God. And it doesn't matter if you are it doesn't matter if you didn't get make it onto the cheerleading team. What matters is you and that you exist and that you're here for a purpose. And it's a beautiful purpose, even if it's a really, really painful purpose at the time. Yeah. Any last thoughts on angelhood before we move on to mommy cat? Just that it's, it's definitely All right. Worth, and I think it's especially worth discussing not just the aspects of this, of and high school drama, um, but also just uh, the aspects of the super of the the afterlife and the supernatural that it does kind of bring to bear in a very understandable way for teens. Yeah, yeah, I think so. In a very discussable way too. It brings up a lot of questions. So hi highly recommended, but especially for younger teens, um, parents read along with your kids. So let's talk about of all the three books about the afterlife that we have looked at for this month. The one that made me cry the most, I cried at Angelhood. I think I even cried a little bit, Inspector. I have sobbed and choked my way through Mummy Cat. How is that for ridiculous? <laughs> oh my goodness. This book is so cute. It's the story of a cat who was buried with his, um, that in the book is called Hot Shep Soot. So she's sort of inspired by hot, uh, Hold on, he he flips some more. Anyway, no, he he calls her Hitchupset, and her name is Hitchupset. Right. Okay. So but it's it has like to rhyme it's with pet. The, the important thing is it has to rhyme with pet. In the poem. Uh, oh, so right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh yeah, it has to rhyme with pet. <laughs> That's adorable. But anyway, Mummy Cat is about this cat who's been mummified with his uh his queen, and she was his. She was his friend, and he was her best pet. And I think it's, it starts every hundred years, this mummy cat rises from his grave to look for his queen and see if she will wake up and they can be together again, which is just the stinking cutest thing. Now, I'm not saying this because I think that um, that if you mummify a cat and, and, a, and the person who loves the cat, that they will come back to life and it's fiction and it just shows us the power of 
you, all sorts of bonds, even the bond between a human and a pet, they mm. live on even after we humans pass away. What are some other thoughts on mummy cat? Because I'm in danger of monopolizing this conversation about mummy cat. <laughs> well, <laughs> but the contrast between mummy cat and the other two is the relationship with the afterlife and the other two books is one of, of forgiveness, both forgiving yourself and forgiving other people. Whereas in this, it's like the positive side, which is friendship, which still does exist. Are you going to cry? Because I'm going to cry. <laughs> I'm going to try not to cry because I think what this reminded me of very strongly was I lost my grandmother a couple of years back. And I still wish I could talk to her. There are days when, like, the only thing that will solve a mood would be to call her and talk to her, and I can't. But it's the way that we have the need of forgiveness of sins that have been committed after death, like you were talking about. The Im there's impact of positive actions as well, and there's the impact of the friendship that you had. Yes, somebody dies, but that impact still carries on. That was beautifully put. My <laughs> cleaner <laughs> chair is over there, so I can't cry. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn. <laughs> Um, in on mummy cat. <laughs> yeah, my daughter thought it was very sad, <laughs> but she they enjoyed listening to it because I read this with the little kids. Um, I think what's interesting, any kind of pre-Christian era, I find it fascinating that there's still this recognition that there's there's got to be something more, that there's some kind of afterlife, and even if there's no Christ, they have no knowledge of anything, it's kind of written on our hearts that we're made for something that lasts beyond this. Um, so I think that's very interesting just in itself, but it's a, it is such a cute story and it is moving the poor kitty cat. <laughs> uh, so. I like that point about how, and like I was trying to say at the beginning that we are craving something beyond here. I think it was GK Chesterton said that, you know, what I can't remember the exact quote, but it was something along the lines of, you know, all peoples, no matter what their religion or lack of religion, all agree on one thing, and that is something wrong, is wrong with people. <laughs> and that's, I think, one of those things that is wrong with people is that we are made for more than this, more than what is here and what is now. And in Mummy Cat, you see, you know, he shows, Marcus Hewitt shows the, you know, the, the beliefs in a very cute, adorable, snuggly ways. I mean, we've got snuggly mummies. What are the odds of that? <laughs> And it shows that, you know, this is something we've always been looking for. And I, like I said before, with, you know, my atheist friends, they're convinced that this is it and this is the end. But they had to convince themselves. And I think that in and of itself says something. So any last thoughts on Mummy Cat before we finish up? Nope. Nope. I have it for another three weeks, and I might read it every couple of days. Right. <laughs> I think that we keep getting this from the library. We've gotten it so many times. I think we might just go buy an actual <laughs> copy. Marcus Ewart is like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I highly <laughs> recommend it. Um, so I just well, I wanted to ask, though. Um, I wanted to ask, because you guys are moms and have little ones. How was it reading this to small ones? Was it really, like, too much for them or did they like this was it did they get the bittersweetness of it or my um so my little ones are nine six and four and um the the, the two youngest just sort of absorbed the story and they like the pictures and everything the nine-year-old's the one that was like it's so sad <laughs> you know and, and she enjoyed it but she she got it more you know she understands more and this is the girl that's like begging me for a pet <laughs> Day, oh, day out. <laughs> so, uh, but that is one of her concerns about she wants a pet but what if it dies you know and so we've talked about that but yes yeah, it, depending on the age I've had some different reactions good to know I only really read it to my seven-year-old and um getting it out of the library probably for about a year off and on and um I think she was just more touched by the cuteness of this little cat that, you know, tried to defend. There's a, this really sweet scene where the queen and her sister, the, the sister's very jealous and she actually poisons the queen. 
and how the kitty cat, you know, tried to defend his queen. And I think she was just, you know, touched by, I don't even know if touched is the right word, but she just, you know, thought, oh, kitty cat. I don't, I don't know if she got the whole uh, bittersweetness of the, you know, the reunion at the end. And I'm sorry, spoiler. <laughs> There's a reunion at the end, the little mummy scuttle. <laughs> I, I don't think she got it, but I think, um, Carolyn, your nine-year-old is probably, like, at that point where she's reaching that maturity that she can yeah. really, you know, more deeply understand the permanence of death and what is lost and what, through imaginative writing, can sort of be regained. Yeah. Yeah. So. I totally missed the fact that the sister was involved. Oh, we only found out it was sis her sister because we went back and finally read. There are these hieroglyphs. Oh, hieroglyphs, yeah. Without I the like. Now that I look back, I see the pictures of the like angsty older sister, and she goes and collects the scorpion in the woods. Yes, yeah. But see, I totally missed that the first time. Yeah, you have to like. It doesn't say in English that it's her sister. It just says in the okay. hieroglyphics. So you have to go back and read the hieroglyphics, and if. You know, if you have not been convinced yet to go get a copy of Mummy Cat, one of the hieroglyphics in there is the hieroglyphic for meow. Like, yeah. they have the little speech bubble and meow in hieroglyphics in there. It's so stinking cute. All right. Like I said, I'm going to not, I'm just going to keep talking about Mummy Cat. And it's this tiny little book. Let's talk. Um, next month is November. Whoa, I sorry. I kicked my desk again. That's crazy. Um, we're going to be talking about holidays so that you can start thinking about some holiday books, maybe to buy as gifts, maybe to buy yourself as a gift. We're going to be talking about um, The Bird's Christmas Carol by Kate Wigan. That's our children's read aloud. We're going to be talking about Unearthing Christmas by Anthea Piscaric and Christmas Grace by Leslie Lynch, her only book that I haven't read yet. So I'm glad I have an excuse to read it now. It, it has reached, you know, the top of my very long pile <laughs> to be read. Um, Carolyn and I, this month, October, are going to be at two events together. We're going to be at the National Wine Women in the New Evangelization Conference, and that is October 21st. 21st, thank you. That's in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, um, hosted by the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And then we'll also be at the Harrisburg Women's Diocesan Women's Conference on October 14th. 14th. Sorry, I should know this off the top of my head. Anyway, check out our web pages and our newsletters for um, for information on those things. Uh, Rebecca, anything you want to shout out? Are you looking for oh, some any, any work right now, or are you too full? <laughs> I won't be doing anything constructive other than going to Le Mis, going to Chicago to see Le Mis, which totally isn't constructive. So <laughs> you guys are doing like you know constructive things. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, have fun. <laughs> I'm just being a millennial over here. <laughs> You're a very productive millennial, and I am honored to have you on the team. Um, so anyway, that's it for actually next month is going to be our last one for 2017. Keep an eye out on our webpage. Sign up for my newsletter. I'm going to have some updates about what we've got coming on, some changes, um, additions, not subtractions for Sabbath Rest Book Talk for 2018. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Have a great month, and we'll see you later. Very toss. Good night. Bye.